And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. Those words of Acts 15, 40 and 41 are only one of several records of the work of the apostles of Jesus, who planted churches, then revisited those Christians to support and increase their growing faith. The word translated confirming means establishing besides, strengthening more, rendering more firm. The record continues in Acts 16.4 to show what they did and what resulted. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. This Confirming the Church's Bible class focuses on those decrees of the apostles that will help us to grow stronger in faith and service if we learn and apply them. We come today to the end of Ephesians chapter 6, the end of the epistle to the Ephesians in the study that has been continuing now for some weeks. And we thank you for studying with us along the way, and we pray that these uh, lessons have been somewhat uh, helpful to you. And as always, of course, if you have questions or uh, interests in other particular studies or doubts or details you'd like to know more about uh, anything in uh, this epistle we've been studying, we'd be glad to hear from you. Contact information is uh, here behind me on the wall at the beginning of the end, beginning and the end of um, all of these uh, all of these lessons. Uh, again, thank you for studying with us. Let's turn now to uh, Ephesians chapter six, and we want to begin reading today in verse number 10, where we left off last time. The Apostle Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, Take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and, having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, Paul says, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that uh, therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And he goes on to close the epistle with some uh, personal greetings and uh, instructions and information. Let's look at this passage, which is probably familiar to all of us, or at least uh, most of us, regarding the whole armor of God. And we've studied this, probably you've heard lessons on it uh, several times in your life. Let's take a quick look at it as we close out this epistle, remembering that this is Paul's conclusion to the epistle in which he has described in very practical terms the relationship between Christ and the church. Along the way, we have seen specific instructions regarding our worship, regarding our individual relationship with Christ, regarding our relationships with one another in all walks of life as we are Christians together in the body of Christ. And so Paul's conclusion is now to all of us, of course, but to each one of us individually because these instructions must be applied individually. You must do it, I must do it. What does he tell us to do as children of God? Put on the whole armor of God. Now, we see as we look down at the specifics in this list, he's talking about spiritual things, but he's describing it in terms of the armor that the Roman soldier would wear. And he'd have the helmet and the breastplate and he'd have the sword and, and all of the things that Paul mentions here. And we know what those specific pieces of armor and weaponry are for with regard to the soldier. And so Paul makes spiritual application to us as Christians. Let's look at them quickly here. Paul says, starting off, having your loins girt about with truth. Well, 
the, the, the girdle or the, the, the binding uh, apparatus would be a belt or sometimes maybe a rope, but usually uh, something heavy enough and strong enough to hang other weaponry on, uh, specifically the, the, uh, the sword that would be mentioned later. What binds the Christian together? What holds his clothing on, spiritual clothing? Well, Paul says, that's truth. When we know the truth, and when we put it first and foremost, everything else will hang on it, attach to it, and it will fit properly as it should, just as the soldier's armor fit properly because he had first the, uh, the belt on which things were to hang. It was designed for that purpose, and it was sufficient for that purpose. Truth is designed to guide us and and to carry us through everything we need in life. God has told us who He is, who we are, how this world came to be, why we're here, and where we're going. The truth of all of that makes everything else fall into place properly. And so as Christians, we start off with the truth. We have to know the truth in order to become Christians, but we keep studying and keep learning more of what God has said to us. And we continue to conduct our lives according to truth, not as many in the world are doing today according to feelings, according to personal opinions, according to selfishness, according to the ways of the people around us. These are not the things that hold us together. These are not the things that will hold all of the pieces of our life together. We start off with truth. And then the breastplate. What comes before? When you face the Roman soldier, we saw, you saw his armor. What should a neighbor see first in the Christian? That's righteousness. Jesus spoke of it often in his life. He prayed for it. We see him in John chapter 17. He prays for us that we may be like Him, that we may have love for one another, that our righteousness will be seen by the world so that the world will know that Jesus is the Son of God and that there is a heaven, there is a hell, there is a judgment day coming. And each one of us can be pleasing to God because He's told us exactly how. Righteousness is that characteristic which is first seen in the Christian by those he meets along the way. And then he says, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What does he mean by that? Be ready always. As Peter said, be ready to give an answer always to everyone who asks you a reason of the hope that's in you. Christians should always be ready to tell the gospel wherever they go. Be, uh, be ready to, to see every opportunity and to go into that opportunity with full confidence that we're carrying the truth and uh, that we have lived a life of righteousness that will give us some credibility to the people to whom we're speaking. And then we speak the truth in a way that they can see that Jesus is the Son of God and they can turn and follow Him and glorify God in Him also. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You know, it's one thing to read the Bible and recognize that it's true, that it's a good book, but it's quite another to have full faith in God. And if we have that certain conviction that God in heaven lives, uh, that Jesus is His Son, that a judgment day is coming, heaven and hell are real places, that the Bible that we have is the truth, then whatever darts the enemy shoots our way will fall uh, harmlessly, uh, not, not destroying our relationship with God. Because we absolutely, positively know that God is in heaven and this book is His truth. And we can live by it knowing what it says and knowing that we will be pleasing to Him for the way that we have lived. And take the helmet of salvation. Well, what does he mean by that? Salvation 
isn't the helmet, but that's the crown of it all. That's at the very top. I've got salvation. I know that I'm saved. And um, that knowledge, the, the uh, characteristic within us that shows forth when we have that conviction will be again uh, evident to the world around us. So they, people will say, you know, I want what you've got. And many have said that to Christians in many parts of the world. There's something about you. I would like to know what that is. When that which uh, crowns our life and carries us forward is the uh, certain knowledge of uh, promised salvation from God, uh, then we are prepared to go meet the world as servants of Almighty God. And then he says, finally, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And then he goes on about prayer. But, you know, we've come all the way down to here before we have an offensive weapon. Everything else is just protective. God will protect His people when we have full, confident faith in Him. And then take the sword of the Spirit, the weapon that we have as we go into the world is not our opinion, not our tradition, uh, not our personality. It's just simply the Spirit of God. Take this book and preach the gospel to every creature. That was the instruction of Jesus to the apostles. That was the instruction of the apostles to the church. And that was the practice of the church when God was pleased with what they were doing with their time. That's the Christian's life, the Christian's obligation to God, the Christian's joy is to go forward in full confidence that as a child of God, he can wield this weapon, if you will, not in a vicious way and uh, of condemning others, but to defeat the sin that's in them, and to defeat Satan who tries to control them. That's done with the Word of God. And the Christian carries that when he is fully equipped with faith and uh, salvation in Jesus Christ. And then Paul adds, and, and with all of that, with all of that, keep on praying. Pray for everyone, he says. Pray uh, with all prayer and supplication. Uh, we should tell God what we think of Him, how grateful we are to Him, how we want to praise Him, but we also ought to ask Him for what we want. Too many prayers, I suppose, are just, you know, Lord, I want this, I want, give me, give me, give me. That comes next. Prayer and supplication. Praise God in prayer. Thank Him for what you have, and then ask Him for what you need and God will certainly bless the prayers of the faithful again and again. Example is given in the scripture and the promise of God is right there with it. Uh, he says, pray for me that I might uh, speak the truth, that I might open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of God. We talked about the mystery earlier. That's simply the, 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 what was hidden in the past is now clearly made known and that is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is for the whole world, not just for Israel. And it has nothing to do with the law of Moses or the temple in Jerusalem. It simply has to do with man's heart toward God. That was the mystery that was hidden from, uh, throughout the ages and has now been made known in Jesus Christ and is continuing to make known uh, throughout all the world by the preaching of the gospel. And so Paul concludes with the, uh, with the personal references. But that you also may know my affairs and how I do, Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister of the Lord, shall make known to you all things he was to carry this epistle to them, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that you might know our affairs, and that he might uh, comfort your hearts. Well, Paul wanted the church to be comforted. How were they to be comforted? By the knowledge of what was going on in other places. Uh, when he wrote to uh, Timothy in both of the letters in chapter 4, Paul encouraged the church to be aware of what's going on in other places. When he wrote to the church in Thessalonica, he commended them uh, that their faith was known widely in cities far away. It's good for us to, con to uh, communicate with our brothers and sisters in other places. And it's a sad thing in our day that too many churches 
are just becoming more and more isolationist and having no fellowship or open communication with other churches. That goes on in, in many places, and it's not a good thing. It's not a healthy thing. We need to know how others are doing and the good things that God is doing in other places. Peace be unto you, brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. The grace of God has appeared to all men, but teaching us that we must live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. So much of practical help in the epistle to the Ephesians. And I'm so very thankful that you've joined us in these studies. And I know that if you continue to study the book as it was written, as it was given, as God wants you to do, for all that's in it for you, God will truly bless you. Vainly we seek after men for guiding light Or in dreams for a heavenly call Man of himself cannot set his soul aright So it's back to the Bible for it all Back to the Bible, the God-given Bible, for grace and duty, great or small. Each one may know what to do and where we go, but it's back to the Bible for it all.